Hello, <clears throat> welcome back. So uh, in this lecture, what I want to do is go to a higher level of organization. We had just finished talking about populations and we talked about communities. And now what I want to do is talk with you about biomes and water ecosystems. Uh, biome is a term we use typically for terrestrial ecosystems. And, uh, and, then, um, and then ecosystems is what we use with water. We don't call water biomes. There's no water biomes that we actually use. So we'll talk about biomes and water ecosystems in this lecture. Uh, I guess most of you know about biomes. You have talked about, you know, rainforests or deserts and you're somewhat familiar with that. So what I want to do in this lecture is talk to you about uh, why biomes are located where they are and then I want to talk about uh, um, the different kinds of biomes and some of the plants and animals that, uh, that live in them. And uh, so in this map right here, which is a map you've probably seen before, you, uh, you recognize um, all the various kinds of biomes. Um, that are located around the world. This is a very generic map. When you get into looking more closely, um, you know the biomes don't work out so well. But at at a a high a low level of resolution, um, biomes seem to be found in certain locations all across the world. For example, I, I guess you could represent or, or 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 see that rainforests are typically found near the equator. So we see rainforest here, 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 and here. And uh, and then your and then your deserts are typically located around 30 degrees south and north. So if you look at all the little yellow spots here, 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 and here, they're typically located about 30 degrees. If you go up to higher latitudes, of course, you have the tundra, and then you have the coniferous forest right underneath that. So um, you know it's it's interesting to look at a map like this, but uh, what I want you to do is to understand why. Uh, it looks like this. For example, there are some kind of strange things like, like uh, if you look up here, in, uh, in in some of northern Europe, you know, really it should be tundra or coniferous forest, but it's 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 really temperate deciduous forest. Okay, so that's kind of a, a quirky little thing. And uh, you know, here at the equator, you have this little band of coniferous forest and tundra. And that seems to be kind of odd since it's at the at the and you can see it over here as well. So you can see that at the at the equator you have coniferous forests, and so um, you can see that there's a desert in the middle of Australia. And you know you got to begin to wonder why do these biomes why are they distributed like they are? So I want to suggest to you a few ideas about why they're located where they are. Okay, so you know, kind of the definition of a biome is is a particular place that has a specific climate, climate being average precipitation and average temperature, and uh, and specific kinds of uh, plants and animals. So that's kind of what we consider to be a biome. Now, climate is a really complex phenomenon. Typically, it's the average weather pattern um, over longer periods of time. So we're talking like more than 30 years to a million years is uh, what we consider to be, uh, you know, the averages uh, for, for that area would have to be inclusive of 30, at least a 30 year data set to get what we call climate. Climate is determined by precipitation and average temperature. And uh, so this precipitation and this temperature, you know, at certain temperatures or certain precipitations, you're gonna get different kinds of animals and plants that can live in those particular areas. And uh, of course, Precipitation and climate are, are going to be um, uh, influenced by latitude. Latitude is how far you are from the equator. So if this is the equator, this would be the northern latitude, southern latitude. Um, precipitation and temperature are going to be uh, uh, affected by altitude. That is, if you're on a mountain, going up a mountain, that's going to be altitude. And then proximity uh, to the ocean and ocean currents wind patterns, a lot of these things will affect uh, the kind of climate um, you know, um, a particular area is going to have. When you put into consideration all of these things, this is going to affect what kinds of plants and animals that you can have in a certain area. So let me show you a few of the effects of a few of the things we just described. So here we're looking at um, different biomes and you're looking at ocean currents. So if you want to understand why northern Europe has 
Um, you know, if you go over, it doesn't hit coniferous forest or tundra. It's because of this thing called the Gulf Stream. So warm water at the equator is moving up north. And because of this Gulf Stream, it's influencing the climate over here in Europe so that it's more mild than what it normally would be. Okay, so that's an example of a, an ocean current influencing um, the kinds of uh, plants and animals that can live in an area. And you can see there's ocean currents all over the world, and all of these different ocean currents are going to influence um, the kinds of climate that you might have in different areas. Another thing that influences the kinds of plants and animals you can have in a particular area um, is, the, is the tilt of the earth. So you're probably familiar that the earth is tilted on an axis. It's a 23.5 uh, 23 degree axis. And uh, so as the earth is going around the sun, because the earth is on an axis, on a tilt, different parts of the earth are going to experience different levels of sunlight through the different seasons. Now at the equator, they typically get the same amount of sunlight all year round. But in, say, in the northern hemisphere, so here in the northern hemisphere during the June solstice, June 20th is the longest day of the year, um, you can see that the sunlight is going to strike more towards the northern latitude, less towards the southern latitude. So when we have summer up here um, in the northern latitude, uh, they're having winter down in the southern latitude. Okay, but that's all because of the tilt of the Earth. Now, and you know, when you go to um, into the uh, September, the tilt of the of the Earth is such that we're getting less sunlight. We get the least amount of sunlight on um, December the 20th, and so less of the sunlight is striking. So up here in the extreme northern latitudes at the pole, North Pole, you know, they have very, very large, uh, large amounts of, of nighttime, very little daylight during uh, December uh, solstice. And then as you move to March, the tilt of the Earth allows for more sunlight to strike. All right, so what this creates, this tilt of the Earth, what this creates is uh, different seasons. So if you go to the equator, they don't have different seasons. They may have a wet season and a dry season, but in the northern and southern latitudes, extreme northern and southern latitudes, we get four seasons. So that influences the kinds of plants and animals that can live in a particular area. <clears throat> and this is just showing you solar radiation. So solar radiation, more sunlight strikes the equator than it does in the northern or southern latitudes. Okay, and that's going to create a situation where there's more sunlight, therefore it's going to be warmer. As you move away from the poles, that influence is less and less. So that influences the kinds of plants and animals that you can have in a particular area. So, you know, when we get around the, uh, the equatorial region, it's called tropical. And when we move away from that, we get into subtropical and then warm temperate and then cool temperate. And eventually at the poles, it gets to be cold. So that influence of less and less sunlight as you move away from the equator makes for different kinds of climates. And different kinds of climates has different, you know, produces different, allows different kinds of plants and animals to live in a particular area. <clears throat> so another thing that uh, is kind of interesting is that at the tropics where you get your greatest um, influence of solar radiation, um, you can see that at the tropics, air tends to rise because it's being heated. It tends to rise. Hot things rise. Cool things descend. So the reason we have rainforest at the tropics is because all of that sunlight striking the equatorial waters is causing lots and lots of, uh, of, of um, moisture to form. And then when that moisture hits the upper atmosphere, it condenses and cools and then comes back as precipitation. Okay, so so that's why we have rainforest in the equatorial regions, the sub-equatorial regions, because you have more of that water evaporating. Now, as the air loses its water, it descends, and it's very dry as it descends because it's lost its moisture. So notice that's at 30 de degrees latitude. Um, so at 30 degrees latitude, that's where we're going to find um, our main deserts. So I'm just doing 30 degrees latitude. This is where we're going to find our, our main uh, deserts. Now there's other factors that influence um, that as well. So you know we don't have a desert over here in, in um, 
in eastern North America. So we don't have any deserts right here in eastern North America because we have the warm water from the Gulf Stream and from the Gulf of Mexico that's influencing the precipitation. Therefore, it's influencing the kinds of plants and animals that can live there. So these cells here, they're called hadron cells. These cells here form where you have warm air rising and then cool, and then, and then, uh, cool uh, dry air descending. So we have some areas where you can see right here in these particular places, you have warm air rising yet again because of the air that's replacing. So we have air coming in. So up here in the in the, uh, North America, we have the, the the rainforests that are temperate rainforests. And then if you get down to New Zealand, you have temperate rainforests in New Zealand as well. Okay, so these hadron cells are just air circulation currents where warmer rises and then it falls after it lost its water, it falls and it's dry. And that creates a, a situation where you have deserts where they're supposed to be and you have rainforests where they're supposed to be. Here's just a different view of it. Rainforest where the warm air is rising, hits the upper atmosphere and rains back. Deserts forming where that dry air comes back down. Where the warm air is rising, we have, we have um, the temperate rainforests. And this picture right here is also showing you another effect as well. It's called the Coriolis effect. Um, see, there's fluid over the surface of the Earth. The fluid is the atmosphere. And as the sphere that we call the Earth, as it rotates on its axis, that fluid is deflected. So, for example, the fluid, the air is actually deflected because the Earth is moving this way. The air is deflected up and to the right. Okay, if you go down to the uh, lower uh, hemisphere, it's deflected to the, uh, to the left. Okay, so it's deflected this way. Uh, probably that's deflected to the right as well, excuse me. Okay, so the spin of the Earth with that fluid, the atmosphere, the spin is going to create all kinds of wind currents. And those wind currents are going to be very uh, important to what kinds of plants and animals can live in certain areas. And that's just showing you this hadron cells again, but it includes all the different um, land biomes that you can see correlated with the rise of the air and the fall of the air. Rise of warm air, fall of dry air. Fall of dry air, you get deserts. Warm air rising creates precipitation in tropical rainforests or temperate rainforests, if we look right here. <coughs> so wind not only affects uh, uh, land biomes, it also affects water ecosystems as well. So the movement of, uh, of the surface water, for example, if, um, if the surface air water, uh, warm water moves this way, cold water moves from uh, deep below and upwelling occurs where nutrients are brought up, brought up here and it creates a lot of, of nutrients for fish to feed on. So in some places of the world you have nutrient upwelling that creates an ecosystem that's very 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 plentiful with lots and lots of fish and lots of birds eating the fish. And then of course if you get the movement of, of warm surface water moving this way you don't have as many nutrients coming up. So wind really influences not only um, terrestrial ecosystem uh, biomes, but uh, water ecosystems as well. Um, this is just showing you what happens in a pond. So depending upon the latitude that you find yourself in, away from the equator, you can have a situation where you have different kinds of seasons, winter, spring, autumn, and summer. And uh, what's kind of interesting is the water cools from, uh, from autumn from summer to autumn, as the water cools, water finds that uh, itself to be uh, most dense when it gets to a particular temperature. So that's probably right around, um, you know, something of the order of four degrees Celsius. Uh, it begins, it has its most density. When it's most dense, it sinks, and then warmer, excuse me, um, and then water that's less dense will actually rise. That causes upwelling of nutrients. So in the autumn and in the spring, you will find that um, that uh, this, these upwelling events will occur and you'll have algae blooms. It's also called eutrophication. And uh, so sometimes you can see that naturally occurring on ponds. Again, that's the influence of, um, of uh, temperature. 
right, so another thing that will affect uh, what kinds of plants and animals can live in a particular area will be, um, will be uh, mountains. So if you notice uh, here, this is an example from the West Coast. We have the Coast Range and the Cascade Range. Water coming off the Pacific Ocean is going to lose its precipitation when it hits these mountains. You can see in the second example here, it loses precipitation. And then on the other side, you have Death Valley. So these Cascade and Coast Ranges are very, very wet and uh, lots of trees. But you go on the other side, east of those, you're going to find Death Valley. It's going to be very, very, very dry because all the precipitation has been lost. And this is called the rain shadow effect. The rain shadow effect. So, um, so that's something that you can see sometimes uh, as well. We even see that in Virginia. We have some areas like the mountains get lots of rain, and then on the east side of the mountains, it's a little bit drier. Okay, so this is just a picture showing you what happens when you go up in latitude. So as you go from the equator all the way to the poles, you go through a series of, uh, of terrestrial biomes. You go from tropical rainforest, deciduous forest, coniferous forest. When you get really high latitude, you get tundra, and eventually you get polar ice and snow with uh, very few things, at least terrestrial, that uh, are alive. Okay, so that's the simulation you get from going from the equator to the poles. And uh, so what we see, though, in mountains is that you can start start at the base of a mountain at the equator, and you can be in tropical rainforest. And in the same day, you can walk to a to a high enough area where you have deciduous forest, then you have coniferous forest, and you have tundra, and then you have where nothing can grow, where you have um, uh, basically um, high altitude tundra, or you, you basically have uh, just rocks because it's so cold and uh, and so little um, precipitation. So um, what's kind of interesting so that as you move up the mountain, it simulates what you do going up in latitude. The reason that that actually happens is that as you go up the mountain, the environmental conditions change. So at the very base of the mountain, where it, at the equator, it's tropical rainforest because it's very warm, very moist. Um, but as you move up the mountain, it gets cooler and it gets cooler and it gets cooler. So, um, so it simulates what happens when you go up in latitude, which is where you go from being hotter to being colder. Okay, so that's a simulation that you can actually see going up a mountain. So if you look at one of the most specious places on Earth, one of the places that has the greatest diversity, uh, Peru uh, has the Andes Mountains, and it's in a tropical rainforest. And it's so diverse because you have deciduous forest, coniferous forest, tundra, and you have tropical rainforest, all in a little small area that you can hike in one day. You could go through all those different ecosystems, perhaps even desert in uh, some of the areas on some of the mountain slopes. And this is just a climograph, and it just tries to indicate to you what kinds of ecosystems are possible when you have certain temperatures and certain precipitations. So on the x-axis here, we have precipitations. On the y-axis, we have temperatures. So, I mean, you know, if you have very, very low temperatures and very low precipitations, you're going to create a situation where typically you're going to have Arctic and Alpine tundra. Alpine tundra is mountain tundra. When you go to the coniferous, when you go to uh, intermediate amounts of precipitation and cold temperatures, you create coniferous forest. When you go to lots of precipitation and, and, and a nice temperature, temperate forest. Of course, lots and lots of precipitation and hot temperatures create rainforest. Um, so there, there must be, if you look at this particular area here, there must be something else that's creating certain, besides precipitation and temperature, that's creating certain kinds of ecosystems. Because you can see in this area here, in this shaded area here, you get the overlap of many different ecosystems. So there are other things in place like herbivores and fire and, uh, and other factors that will shape in, in, you know, what kind of terrestrial biome can exist in addition to precipitation and temperature. All right, now what I want to do is just kind of cruise through the different biomes. Um, these are probably very familiar to you, so I won't spend a whole lot of time 
Um, but this particular biome, as you are familiar with, is the desert. Um, the desert ecosystem is a, is a tough ecosystem. The abiotic or non-living factors include um, very, very, very low humidity, high temperatures, cold nights, warm, warm days, um, extreme um, you know, uh, drought, low precipitation. Maybe there's a monsoon season. Uh, it just depends on the different desert as to what's going on there. This happens to be an example of an American desert. If you go to the deserts in, in, uh, in say, uh, Africa, they're going to have different species. Um, the deserts, like the Gobi Desert in, uh, in Mongolia, that's going to have different species as well. Completely different species. Now, they're going to be, because of convergent evolution, because things evolved um, to meet the demands of different ecosystems, things evolved in a, in a similar way. So there's going to be a lot of things that look similar, but they're going to be really, really different if they're on different continents. Okay. So in this little ecosystem here, you have things like uh, kangaroo rats. Um, you know, they're going to be some of your uh, herbivores. And uh, we got, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of lizards. We have jackrabbits and roadrunners and all different kinds of snakes. Um, and uh, plants will be like cacti, agave, yucca, creosote bushes. These will be some of your main plants. Um, you know, it's not a dead environment. It is, it is, does have biodiversity to it. It is, you know, worthy of protection. Um, but uh, these creatures all have adaptations to allow them to survive in the um, in this very harsh environment. Some creatures have um, have uh, behavioral adaptations, like these snakes will only come out at night. Uh, lizards will come out in the early morning and then kind of, you know, go away when it's really super hot. Um, but there's also uh, physiological adaptations. So, for example, the jackrabbit has these big ears because those are like built-in air conditioners. There's a lot of capillaries there, and the, the movement of air across those capillaries cools the animal down. The kangaroo rat has physiological adaptations like a more efficient kidney. So it has like a toothpaste-like urine, not a liquid urine, so it can retain more water in its body. Of course, you have, um, you have the cacti, which is, um, which is uh, going to have spines, and those spines will, um, will protect it from things grazing on it. It also has the ability to store water. Uh, large root system. So these yucca plants out here have a large root system and a deep root system. So every species has an adaptation to allow it to survive in this very stark uh, environment. Now I want to talk also not only about the biome but some of the things that might be threatening the biome. So these are just a few things that are threatening desert ecosystems. Uh, large desert cities, um, you know, destruction by vehicles and urban development. Irrigation, you know, we actually farm in uh, California, we farm a lot in the deserts. And uh, when we take and pump water into an area that's dry, the, the e water evaporates really quickly and it leaves salt behind. So it causes salinization of the soil. It causes soil to become salty. And many plants can't grow, most plants can't grow in salt, salty soil. Um, you know, to irrigate crops, we deplete underground water supplies, and that lowers the water table for the plants and creatures that live in that area. Uh, there's pollution and mineral extraction that occur a lot in deserts and storage of toxic and radioactive wastes. And, uh, and lately, you know, we've had large solar arrays and solar collectors that are being put out there in the deserts. Uh, and, you know, that's a good thing because it diminishes the fossil fuels we use, but it's a negative thing because it diminishes the, the uh, environment. All right, so let me talk a few, a little bit about, uh, for a few minutes about gra uh, grasslands. Uh, you know, there's not one grassland, but there are dry grasslands. This happens to be an example of a dry grassland where you have, uh, and this would be in Africa. So you can see some of the species there, gazelles, warthogs, and uh and topi and oryx and things of that nature. Here is a moist grassland. So you have, you know, where it fills up with water is usually a rainy season there. And you might have, you know, zebra and wildebeest, wildebeest and cape buffalo and perhaps water bucks. Okay. Of course, I'm not showing you any of the predators there, but there will be predators as well, lions and such. We have dry thorn scrub where you might have a few trees that are that are through there, but mainly grasses. So you can see the rhino and uh, East African eland and giraffe might uh, enjoy those particular habitats. Getting near a river, we have a riverine forest, which, you know, it does have some trees right near the river, but mainly it's grasslands. You might have African elephants there and and uh, dukers and kudu and 
and bush bucks and things of that nature, in addition to the predators. Here's an American example. Notice the species are completely different. We don't have water buffalo on our prairies, but we do have, you know, coyotes and wolves, and we have antelope and bison and golden eagles and prairie dogs and cool grasshoppers and grasshopper sparrows. So again, every ecosystem around the all the different biomes around the earth are going to be different. So, for example, the African grasslands are going to be different than American grasslands. Uh, in terms of species, but the species have evolved in a very similar way to meet the demands of, of you know, that particular precipitation and, uh, and temperature, okay? So when you are in a grassland, doesn't matter where, where you are in the world, it's going to see similar, there are going to be many similar convergent um, adaptations, um, but uh, the species will definitely be different, okay? Now, on a grassland, to survive, you have to either dig holes to survive from predators, or you have to have good eyesight to see your prey, or you have to be able to run very fast. Um, you do have to be able to eat grass or eat something that eats grass. So that's something you have to have. Um, grasslands are notorious for being dry, extreme climates, very cold in the winter, very, very hot in the summer. Um, they can have periods of drought. Uh, tornadoes, so there's a lot of, of, of uh, interesting things that occur in uh, grasslands. Um, this, is, uh, this is considered to be a polar grassland by some books. Some books will call this the uh, tundra, so I just went and included it here. The tundra is uh, extreme latitude, extreme, it, it's extre found in extreme high latitudes or on the tops of mountains. Um, and uh, and so they're going to have creatures like this is an American example grizzly bears and caribou and uh, horned lark lots and lots and lots of bugs black flies mosquitoes snowy owls arctic fox ptarmigan would be something you would find there in lemmings these are little rodents um, of course the main plants are going to be mosses and uh, and lichens and uh, that's going to be the base of the food chain okay. To live here, you have to be able to survive um, extreme cold, either migrate or have physiological adaptations to, to, to survive in extreme cold, or you're going to, <coughs> excuse me, or you're going to uh, um, just have, have to be able to, to survive in some kind of way. Snowy owls sometimes will migrate and, and uh, south, and the caribou will do the same thing. Um, but uh, some of these creatures live here all year, year round, like the lemmings. You know, they'll just uh, dig in underneath the snow and, and survive and hibernate. And, uh, of course, grizzly bears hibernate and uh, survive the, uh, the uh, environment. Um, something that's interesting about the environment here is permafrost. So if you dig a hole, uh, a hole right there, you'll find that you'll get to a place where there is frozen. Uh, solid uh, ground frozen underneath, and that's called permafrost. And that permafrost will limit, uh, you know, roots from growing into the soil, and uh, that can be a problem for trees growing there. That's why you don't typically see a lot of trees. You see shrubs and lots and lots of grasses, and, and you'll see um, uh, moss and lichens. Some things that are disturbing these habitats include the conversion of grasslands into cropland, that's a huge problem in the United States. We've converted most of the native prairie to, uh, to cropland. Um, when you uh, do that, you uh, are going to release huge amounts of carbon dioxide from the burning and conversion of the grasslands to cropland. We do overgraze in tropical and temperate grasslands, overgraze livestock. And you can see in this little graphic right here, that's the livestock mowing down all the grass. And it leaves you know, uh, a scrub area where, you know, deserts can easily form. Um, and, you know, oil production and, uh, and different kinds of pollution in vehicles, uh, you know, um, can also uh, cause destruction to these particular ecosystems. All right, well, tropical rainforest, of course, lots of, of precipitation and, uh, and, and very high temperatures. Um, and uh, it depends on, you know, if you're in South America, Central America, or in uh, Borneo and, and Southeast Asia, the, the species are going to change, but the adaptations to living with the water and, uh, and high temperatures are going to be very similar. So lots of convergent evolution. Um, it's hard to know how to show you even what lives in the rainforest. There's so many species. But uh, this is an example of kind of a Central American example, the oscillate here and the harpy eagle. And we have squirrel monkeys. 
all kinds of birds. I mean, it's very, very, very speciose. Lots of tree frogs and, and different species of snakes and just thousands and thousands of different kinds of bugs like the Katie did, but lots of beetles. And, um, and so, uh, you know, very interesting uh, habitat to live in. What's interesting about the rainforest is that you have various kinds of, of layers that exist. So you have a ground layer of herbs, you have a shrub layer, you have an understory, you have a canopy, then you have super, super tall trees called the emergent layer. So it's layered, it's patterned. You can actually see the different layers and the different patterns there. Each different kind of uh, forest ecosystem will have a different layering sequence. So this particular uh, um, picture here is showing you um, uh, a uh, temperate deciduous forest. That's what we have where I'm taking and recording this lecture from. I'm looking out of my window right now at a temperate deciduous forest. And this is where we have oaks and hickories and maples. And, uh, you know, in, in, in Virginia, we have the gray squirrel and white oaks and white-tailed deer. We have weasels and uh, white-footed mice and wood frogs and black racers, all kinds of cool insects. But uh, you know, what, what runs this particular biome is going to be the production of, um, of uh, nut mast, which means lots of acorns, lots of hickory nuts. Uh, chestnut used to be really uh, important, but uh, it, it's uh, died out because of a blight. So, also, uh, this particular ecosystem has seasons. So, we have fall, where the leaves fall off the trees, and that uh, basically creates a situation where lots of bacteria and fungi and millipedes and earthworms, they create a, a food uh, web um, from eating the decomposing leaves. So, um, thick soils, rich nutrient-rich soils, this is a really cool ecosystem and i um, very privileged to live in um, this particular ecosystem. Um, another kind of forest is the coniferous forest, also known as the taiga, and uh, it uh, has less precipitation and uh, the precipitation in the wintertime a lot of times is snow, so it's locked up precipitation, so it's dry and it has cooler temperatures. The species of trees that grow here will be your firs. Um, that happens to be a balsam fir right there. But, uh, you know, spruces, pines, these are going to be needle-like leaf trees. Those little needle-like leaves help to reduce the amount of, um, of water that evaporates out of, the, out of the leaves. Okay, so if you're wondering. They're also evergreen, so they stay green all year round. Um, and this is a North American example. So we have the snowshoe hare, we have moose and wolf, and the, the marten. The marten is a predator that uh, climbs up into trees and hunts. So it's a uh, it's a a pretty formidable predator. Um, so kind of an interesting ecosystem. Again, you go over to uh, to Siberia. That's huge coniferous forest, and the species will change ever so slightly, but uh, same adaptations to the abiotic factors. So of course, uh, with your with your uh, with your uh, biomes that are your uh, tree biomes, clearing and degradation of the forest, uh, you know, are, are pretty pretty important. They're used as timber for agricultural purposes, urban development. Um, so uh, just clearing of the land is a, a big problem, and the conversion of it into um, into tree plantations. So this happens to look like a Christmas tree farm there. Other things that uh, will influence these uh, these biomes, uh, you know, uh, uh, timber extraction, mineral extraction, uh, hydro hydroelectric dams, so dams and reservoirs, you know, wherever you block a large river and create a, uh, uh, a lake behind it, that diminishes the amount of um, of habitat. So you know, air pollution can uh, sometimes uh, destroy forest and uh, some of those things. All right, sorry to be so brief through that, but, uh, we, you know, these biomes are probably somewhat familiar to you, so I didn't want to spend too much time. So now what I want to do is move to water ecosystems. Now, we can't use the word biome for uh, water because it's all connected and it's just problematic. So we use ecosystems to represent water. And there's all kinds of water ecosystems. There's freshwater lakes and freshwater rivers. There are, you know, coral reefs and mangrove swamps. 
So let me go through and talk with you about some of those. Now you can see, generally speaking, that rain, you know that the coral reefs are found in warmer water, and as you move from that, you get out of coral reefs. And uh, freshwater biomes are some huge freshwater lakes all around the the world, um, and these have very very diverse uh, species that live inside of them. Um, you know, I often talk about the ocean being really important for uh, for protecting. Uh, and it's both for uh, ecological services and economic services. Um, the ocean biomes are really important because they uh, provide food for us, medicines, their harbors, you know, they provide recreation and employment, minerals, building materials. So economically, the oceans are really super important. But also, ecologically, they're really super important too because they help to moderate the climate. They absorb a lot of the, temp, uh, the heat coming from the sun. They absorb carbon dioxide and reduce the amount that's in the atmosphere. You know, we dump our waste products into, our treated waste products into water, and the bacteria in the water um, destroy the, uh, um, the waste products and, and recycle the waste products. Of course, they're nursery grounds for food that we eat. They're a source of genetic resources and, and biodiversity, so future medications. They provide huge amounts of scientific information for us, and they reduce the impact of storms. When you talk about mangrove swamps and barrier islands, these help to protect us from storms, such as hurricanes. And the, the ecosystems are varied, and th this is just a picture showing you some of the different terms we use for um, water ecosystems. So when you go down where light doesn't penetrate, you get into the abyssal zone. And you have really cool creatures that live down there that uh, you know can survive the pressure, can survive the cold temperatures and lack of light. One of my favorite fish happens to be the angler fish. It has a little bioluminescent organ that it will dangle in front of its mouth to attract prey so it can eat the prey. So really cool, uh, really cool fish. The bathyal zone is also known as the twilight zone. So you get um, during the daytime, it's kind of like a little bit of light penetrates down there, but you know, certain species can occupy that particular area. The euphotic zone is where we get to, during the daytime, get uh, plenty of light. So lots of photosynthesis occurs there, lots of phytoplankton and um, and algae and different various things, lots of zooplankton, lots of different fish. Uh, it really becomes speciose when you get into the coastal zone. When you get near the coast, you get lots of nutrients that run off from the land, and those nutrients will feed all the various kinds of, of, uh, of phytoplankton and plants and, uh, and you know, coral animals and things of that nature. Okay, so those are some of the different zones. When you get into where fresh water and salt water mix, you are getting into an estuary. So here's a mangrove swamp. Uh, this is a beautiful area. If you've never had an opportunity to, uh, to go to a mangrove swamp, we have some in, in, uh, in uh, North America, in uh, Florida. So you get a special tree that's adapted to living in salt water. And it has these little roots that come down that anchor it to the to the ground there. Inside of those roots, in between all the little roots, there's all kinds of creatures that live, little little fish, sponges, and uh, and various kinds of cnidarians, such as uh, such as sea anemones and things. Um, jellyfish will live under there, and it uh, protects the leaves that fall. You know, provide food for the animals underneath. One of my favorite animals uh, I've ever seen in a mangrove swamp is the manatee. So it's a really cool grazing herbivore that, uh, that lives in the mangrove swamps. So we have beautiful mangrove swamps down in Florida. I uh, encourage you to go and see those. You can kayak through them, and uh, they're, they're really quite uh, beautiful. This is just a little graphic showing you um, some of the different terms we use for water ecosystems. So we have open ocean here. Uh, if you have a little group of, uh, of islands there, they might create a sound behind that. Um, there may be shallow bays, and then as the as as water is coming down from the mountains and going to the ocean, you might have um, an estuary, saltwater and freshwater mixing. A nice salt marsh here where salt water inundates, but there's some freshwater here too. You can have tidal creeks and tidal rivers where the where each tide, you know, water will come in during high tide, water will go out during low tide, and very special species live in those particular areas. Virginia is uh, is a very special place because we have we do have um, um, bays, 
uh, like Back Bay near Virginia Beach. We have tidal creeks and tidal rivers. Um, you know, the Potomac River, York River, Rappahannock River, um, the James River, all of those are tidal rivers up to a point. And uh, so there's very special species that live in these estuarine uh, environments. And this happens to show an estuarine little food web. Uh, this is what you can see in, in large parts of the Chesapeake Bay. You have uh, tons and tons and tons of salt cord, cord grass that uh, develops. As that stuff dies, as the, as, the, as the cord grass dies and goes into the water, you have, you know, bacteria will break it down. The bacteria will be eaten by zooplankton. It'll be eaten by filter feeders like clams and other filter feeders we studied earlier on. That zooplankton and clams will serve as food for other species of fish and shorebirds. And those things will, will serve as, uh, as food for, um, for uh, higher level predators. Okay, beautiful ecosystem, very, very, very productive. Not a lot of species in estuaries. You know, maybe several thousand species would be what you would find there in the Chesapeake Bay, but uh, huge numbers of them. Very productive uh, habitat. This is one that I'm not too familiar with. I've never been to a, a rocky shore beach or a tide pool. Uh, it's on my life list of things to do. But when you go down there, you can see all kinds of cool things. Uh, all kinds of crabs, hermit crabs, shore crabs, starfish, all kinds of sea anemones, just don't touch them, sea urchins, nudibranchs, which are those uh, flatworms. Uh, so all different kinds of flatworms in these pools. And of course you have low tide. When the water goes out, you can go into pools and look around. And then high tide, you know, it's all flooded. So lots and lots of different kinds of, uh, of mussels and, and gastropods and barnacles, which are crustaceans. So, um, and then, of course, all kinds of uh, a seaweed um, and algae. Well, the beach, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the beach. We have lots of barrier beaches around here. Myrtle Beach and Nags Head and, and Hatteras, all of the barrier islands of uh, North Carolina. And in Virginia Beach, we have Sand Bridge. So, um, so barrier islands are very familiar, but uh, if you go to a, a beach, you know, there's, uh, there's habitats up here, there's habitats down here, different habitats here, you know, where you have low tide and high tide lines, you, um, you're going to have different species that live, okay? So some of the species would be like blue crabs and uh, sandpipers are really familiar, mole crabs, you know, you can see those all, the, all over the place. Uh, you know, there's clams and, and different kinds of worms. And if you go down south enough, you get sand dollars, and moon snails are pretty common. So uh, if you get up onto the beach, you have sea fleas and tiger beetles and all kinds of insects and, and different shore birds and seagulls and things and things and things that live up there. This is showing you a sequence all the way from the ocean, all the way from the ocean to, uh, to a bay. Um, and this would be like uh, kind of like a barrier island. So the, the beach has certain species that uh, can live there. You have dunes where you might even have, you know, um, some small shrubs that live on there. So you might have interdunal ponds. So where these dunes come together, there might be ponds underneath here. And, uh, and that might be um, certain species that can live there. And maybe your, your dunes behind the primary dune, you might have taller shrubs and perhaps behind that trees. And then you'll decline down into a, into a marsh and then eventually into the actual bay. So again, different species all along the way can live and survive. And this is a pretty, pretty harsh environment because it's very dry. That sand makes it very dry and typically it's really uh, hot. Extreme seasonal variations as well. And the coral reef is, uh, is another beautiful uh, ecosystem. So in the coral reef, of course, you have the coral animal that has the symbiotic algae that lives in it, the zooxanthellae algae that lives inside of it. And uh, you might have algae, phytoplankton, and other, other producers as well. Of course, you have zooplankton, you have lots of bacteria, and, uh, and those start food webs that uh, go from there. And you'll have moray eels, all kinds of different fish, lots and lots of species of fish. And of course, sea turtles and sharks and jellyfish are going to be found there as well. Now there's 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 things that are that are destroying the coral reef, and I just want to touch base with it for a second. You know, you you probably heard of stories of the Great Barrier Reef and some of the destruction of it, but um, the warming of the ocean seems to be taking out the Great Barrier Reef. That's at least what we think right now. But um, dirt covering over the reef could be a problem. 
Fertilizer can cause uh, an overgrowth of algae over the surface of coral and block sunlight. Uh, we do destroy mangrove swamps for making um, shrimp farms. Um, coral reef bleaching is occurring for probably because of the temperature of the, uh, of the water warming in certain areas. So um, other things would be the cyanide and dynamite fishing. Uh, removal for uh, building uh, coral, um, uh, to f removing coral for, for building materials, aquaria, and, uh, and jewelry, and then ship anchors and tourism. So this is something we've talked about before. just want to refresh your memory about that. Well, freshwater ecosystems also provide economic services and ecological services too, very similar to uh, what we looked at um, with the saltwater. A little bit more with economic services, of course, they provide drinking water and irrigation and uh, hydroelectric uh, um, dams allow us to generate electricity. So no recognition, recreation and employment, but again, very similar things in terms of ecological services. And there's all different kinds of, of freshwater ecosystems as well. So um, when you look at a freshwater ecosystem like a lake, you have the limnetic zone, which is like uh, the zone where the light actually penetrates. The profundal would be similar to the twilight zone and the benthic zone would be down here at the bottom in the mud or whatever substrate there are. So there is a zone that's near the edge, the littorial zone is, uh, is uh, over here near the edge and you can have some rooted plants that live in the water there. So lots of different uh, you know, species live in water ecosystems. It just depends on where you are in the world. This is just showing you freshwater ecosystems from rain and snow hitting mountains. You know, you have basically lakes and, uh, and glacial lakes. And, and uh, where you don't have glaciers, you have mountain lakes. You may have waterfalls, various kinds of tributary streams, and eventually down into uh, salt marsh and estuaries. Different species live in different areas all along the way. All right, well, that's a quick jump through um, terrestrial biomes and water ecosystems. Um, so I will see you next time, and we'll talk about conservation biology next time. And uh, make sure you keep up with your work, keep up with your reading, keep up with your due dates. Make sure you watch all your lectures. And if you have questions, please feel free to email me or other students. Until next time, I wish you a good evening, morning, or day whenever you're watching this video.